Good morning, and welcome to our Digital Data Flows Masterclass number six. I'm Dr. Sarah Jordan, and I will be helping to MC this morning. Um, th this morning's presentations are going to be on facial recognition. This is the sixth of our classes. There are eight in this series, and we cordially invite you guys to pay attention um, to our upcoming announcements on the FPF classes um, website in order to be able to understand what we're going to be doing next and when. Uh, so this morning, we're going to be discussing things that build on some of our related curriculum. So for example, um, last year we did information on artificial intelligence and machine learning. We've done things on de-identification de and on mobile apps. And apropos of the large conversation now on facial recognition, we'll be discussing that this morning. So for those of you who are joining us remotely, please know that this is being recorded um, and we welcome you to participate actively through our Q&A and also through our Zoom chat. We will also be taking questions from our audience via the Q&A and via the Zoom chat as we develop this presentation. The flow of this morning will be that we'll have 45 minutes of both of our present presenters followed for each with five minutes of clarification questions. Following both presentations, we will have a joint uh, Q&A session. And again, we cordially invite those of you who are in the room and those of you who are remote to participate as actively as you would like. So for those of you who are joining us remotely, again, thank you very much for joining. For those of you who are coming in from the European Union, thank you for joining us on your afternoon. Um, those of you who are familiar with this series already know that this is sponsored by Free University Brussels and also by the Future of Privacy Forum. But those of you joining us here for the first time would, may want to look a little bit more to learn about the Brussels Privacy Hub and also to learn a little bit more about the Future of Privacy Forum. So the Brussels Privacy Hub, information is available at brusselsprivacyhub.eu. Um, obviously, information on Future of Privacy Forum is available on our website, fpf.org. Those of you who are familiar with us know that we are a um, nonprofit here in Washington, D.C., sort of dedicated to the preservation of privacy. Um, the, for those of you who are Joining us for the first time, all of our previous courses are available online, um, and you can go back and look at some of those if you'd like to catch up and find additional information that helps to contextualize this morning's presentation. So this morning, we'll be hearing from two experts on facial recognition. The first is our very own Brenda Lung, who is the Director of AI and Ethics here at the Future of Privacy Forum. Following her presentation and a brief clarification Q&A, we'll hear from Patrick Guther, who is part of NIST, the National Institutes for Standards and Technology here in the United States, who is a computer scientist working for NIST. For those of you in the European Union who are not familiar with what NIST is, you may be actively aware of some of the associated technologies that they have produced, such as things like the atomic clock, other precision me uh, metrics and performance measurement techniques, and also in their privacy and their cybersecurity frameworks. So you'll hear more about what NIST has to offer when Patrick speaks follow, uh, following our presentation by Brenda Lung. Brenda. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you all for joining us today. Make sure this is working. There we go. For a discussion on uh, biometrics, specifically facial recognition technology, which has been in the news just a little bit lately. And I think probably um, anybody signed on today has seen the media, uh, heard, the, heard the hype, and hopefully you're here now to sort of delve down and find out what the facts are, how the technology really works, what some of the privacy implications are, uh, what some of the policy options might be, um, even though that's you know, we're not here to advocate for any one of those in particular today. And then uh, we'll hear from NIST about a lot of the details of the technology that I think will be very helpful for those of you in the positions to need to make judgments and calls about when and where you might want to use facial recognition technology um, in your services or in your agencies throughout the government. So what is facial recognition technology? You might have heard things like one-to-one uh, -one and one-to-many and some of these other kinds of terms, and we'll go through those today. Um, it is a form of biometric, which is a measure of some physical characteristic that is unique to each human being. I'm not going to get into twins and DNA and things like that right now. For the purposes of this, each of us has a, a unique face that is all our own, and we're going to talk about how we might uh, be able to identify people or track people or otherwise engage with them based on that particular biometric. This use of uh, biometrics is driven by the ability to use biometrics in the way that we are today is driven by the increased computing power and advances in machine learning, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment as well. 
um, and gives us a great many capabilities which have both promise and potential and also some concerns, particularly in the privacy realm. A lot of what we see in the media uses the term facial recognition very broadly across any number of categories and it, one of the most important takeaways I would like from today, if you remember nothing else, is that not every camera, not every scenario, not every security recording, not every anything that involves a lens and you interacting is facial recognition. It's a fairly sophisticated program that requires special software and uh, technicians and platforms and, and machinery and um, it is not present all the time. That is not to say that the, it's not being used broadly, but there are many different kinds of video analytic software in use in different use cases. The first is facial detection. This might be like when you hold your camera up and you see a little yellow box around the people in the photo. Um, or it might be some sort of counter in a public space that has a, a camera aimed to count the number of people who go by in a location. And literally all this is trained and designed to do is, is see face or not face so that it can identify when there are people there as opposed to anything else that might be in the frame. Uh, there are no privacy concerns, there's no individual data collected in this scenario. Facial characterization is a step up from that somewhat analogous to what you might do if you had a person standing there looking. I see that a person walks by and I can make certain categorical judgments about them. I might assume um, they're, that they are male or female. I can see how tall they are. I can see how long their hair is, whether they wear glasses. I can even see things like whether they're smiling or seem to be excited or seem to be sad. Um, those are all characterization techniques that are not unique to a person and may or may not be identifiable in any context, but in the uh, particular programs that those are used on. It is a single image that's captured and evaluated or a single moment in time. It doesn't match to anything else in a system um, and it is used to make certain assumptions about the people involved. So maybe if you have a display you want to see that uh, women are stopping at the display that you in fact aimed for women's services or products um, or maybe they're not and that gives you some level of information as an advertiser for example. Verification and identification are the two actual facial recognition levels. So that is to say this is identifying you as a unique person. Verification is what you've heard of as a one-to-one -one matching. That is, you have already enrolled in a database. Your face is in there. And you are now asserting that you are that person. You are saying, I have an authority to be where I am or to do the things I'm asking to do, to move money in my account, to pay um, with my Apple Pay, or to enter a facility, and I am Brenda, and you have Brenda on file, and you match my face today against what's in your file, and say, yes, you are Brenda, and so you get to carry out the activities that you've um, claimed. And then identification, which is the one that's probably the most commonly assumed when people hear this term, which is to say, I collect the face of a person, and I ask the question, can I figure out who this person is? by comparing against some database of existing images. It might be driver's license photos. It might be uh, mug shots. It might be uh, a commercial database that's been put together of loyalty card holders. It might be some public database that's for sale that's been scraped off of uh, public images of people. That database that you're comparing against could have come from a number of different sources. Where and how it is created and used is certainly one of the important questions of a facial recognition system. Um, and that's the identification stage. So I'm going to talk briefly about how the actual technology process works. Patrick's going to do a much more in-depth and probably much more uh, thorough job than I will here. Um, but just I think it's important to have a working knowledge of it so that when we get into the privacy conversation, you sort of have a baseline um, to compare against. So the first thing is, as I said, facial recognition involves comparing two images. One is the image you just collected against an image that already exists in a database. That's the enrollment. So to get that image in the database, you have to have enrolled the person. This could have been when they had their mugshot taken. It could have been the driver's license photo. It could have been when they signed up as an employee of an organization that uses facial recognition for facility access. Whatever the process was, the initial image is taken. And we're going to talk about quality in a minute and so the importance of how that image is collected initially um, and enrolled in the database. And then the second step is now you're going to capture um, that image with software and you're going to extract a template from it. You can see the little diagram there to the right, um, which is a set of points. Uh, again, we'll talk about more about this in a minute, but this is the, um, 
this is the business model. This is the proprietary aspect of facial recognition software, which is how you extract that template from the image, how many points you collect, which points you collect, what you do with them to create that file, and that turns into to a file of ones and zeros. So it's not, an it's not a picture of a person. The way you and I as a human would recognize somebody is to actually look at the person and actually look at the picture. The way this system looks at somebody is to create this template and to compare the templates to each other. So that template is then what's stored in the database. If I come back later and attempt to match it, either because my image is collected and I'm trying to be identified in a one-to-many, or because I'm asserting my identity in a verification scenario, my face will be collected um, with that software again, the template extracted, matched to the one in the file, and then it will give an output recommendation, meaning yes, this is the person, or no, this is not, and this is um, how that comes up with an answer. So what do we do um, with the templates? Well, we, they're stored, that's what's stored. In a best practices scenario, the image itself is not stored. In other words, the actual JPEG picture of the face. Or if it is, it's stored separately in a non-connected, non-tied um, account or file or even on a different server. So the, the template is the output of a proprietary software. That's what's stored in the database. And part of the protection of this is that it's not tied to the template so the, or to the original image. And so the template itself doesn't have value to anyone who doesn't either have the original image or have um, the software itself, the internal workings of the software, to compare it against. There, uh, there are questions about interoperability for these kinds of systems. In some cases, we might want to have inter interoperability. And there have been, um, particularly in the government market, um, on an ANSI standard uh, attempts to do that. Um, but even in those cases, the the individual companies will usually put pr proprietary strings on those templates so that they can uh, maintain control over which ones are theirs and how those are matched um, you know, for their own business purposes, obviously. So this is one of the protections that is to say that if you have a breach in the security world, um, what do you actually breach and what do you end up with? If you breach something that includes both the images and the templates, which um, has happened because in some cases they are being stored together, again, not a best practice, um, then you might have more opportunity to exploit some of the technology weaknesses of that. If you just get the templates themselves, that's a very challenging thing to actually do anything useful with in terms of trying to somehow backtrack that into an image or um, backtrack to what the algorithm itself uh, is doing and figure out how to compromise that in the future. Um, so that's breaching from the inside out, sort of. That's getting the data and then trying to backtrack out. Spoofing is where you're trying to sort of come from the outside in. That's where I want to either put on a mask or hold up a photo or in some other way uh, trick the system into thinking that I am the person or have the person's face that I'm trying to, um, you know, uh, compromise their account um, by convincing the system that I am um, that person when I'm not. So some of the Protections against this are things like liveness detection, so that you can't just hold up a photo. That might involve the fact that you need to make some kind of movement, your eyes need to move, or you need to speak a word, um, are some of the ways to do that. With a really good high quality mask, you can actually still do that movement test and still fake a system. And the best companies know this, and they actually test their system using very high quality, high grade Hollywood masks and things like that to try to keep it to the level um, where that is incredibly difficult to do. No system is perfect. I'm not ever going to stand up here and say that there's no system that you could never spoof. Um, but the companies that sell this understand that their reliability and value is what makes them useful. And they are just as aware of that technology and working hard to um, prevent that. So these are all based on machine learning systems. And I just want to take a second to review what that means in the sense that this is an a ongoing iterative process. So not, as, not only is the system initially trained on a, a training set, which I'll show a, a little bit more in a minute, but also um, it's in a constantly iterative state where the process is becoming more refined as the model or platform gets more real life experience and um, use. We do have another um, seminar on facial, or on artificial intelligence and machine learning on the archive. So please feel free to, to take a look at that if you'd like to know more about that. 
So the training data set that trains the algorithm. This is obviously something that's gotten a lot of attention in the news and in other contexts and is, is clearly very important. This is why for a long time and even still, the uh, perception persists, not just perception, the reality persists that um, many systems are not as accurate across di different demographics because they weren't trained on a sufficiently diverse set of different demographics. As I think Patrick will talk more about later, some of the best systems have corrected for that at this point, but it is still a factor, it is still a reality that in many systems the demographic outputs are inconsistent. So what might have a 99% accuracy rate for some groups will have a much lower accuracy rate for others. And that leads us to the whole issue of accuracy and bias on a facial recognition system to, um, to begin with, which is to say, how do they work and how well do they work? So for different demographics, of course, they must have sufficient training data to be accurate to the levels needed. Um, people also change throughout their lives. The accuracy on children and the elderly is both lower, are each lower than they are for people uh, throughout the sort of middle part of their life. Uh, varies over culture. There are populations that have um, different uh, facial structures, different makeups that have more homogeneous features, and all of these things just take a concentrated effort to make sure that the training data and the systems account for that and are used appropriately. And they all can't, there are examples everywhere around the world of really high quality systems doing really good work on every demographic. Um, so it's not something that can or can't be done on any. Um, particular person. The quality factors are really important here and this is what is not always taken into account when we see some of the media reports about people being matched or um, a police artist sketch trying to be matched to a database or this person looks something like Woody Harrelson so we're going to try to match Woody Harrelson's photo to the database and see um, how that comes out. Uh, those are not things that that can or should happen in any real serious use of a facial recognition system. The enrollment photos are critical in terms of the quality that's used for those. So that's why, for example, your passport photo has to be taken in a certain uh, angle, with certain lighting, with certain quality, with certain requirements. Um, the State Department is now asking that people no longer wear glasses. I recently had my passport updated and my old passport I had glasses on. So when I took the new photo, I didn't think to take them off and they sent it back and they said, no, you can no longer have glasses on in your photo. Um, the pose that you're in, that you are straight on uh, to your face from the front is very important. And all of those things matter both in the enrollment, where it's really critical, and then in the photos that are collected later. So if the image that's collected later is a poor quality image or from the side or with a hat on or in any other way obscuring your face, that's going to impact the ability of the system to maintain a high accuracy level when matching it back to the enrolled photo. And that's where thresholds and settings come into play, which is to say, depending on your use case and what level of risk is involved in a false positive or a false negative, you want to set your thresholds for that system uh, appropriately so that whatever errors might be made are um, at the level that is appropriate for, for what your use is. So if you're letting people into a building, is it more important to err on the side of not letting in somebody who is allowed or at least making more friction in their process because they have to go over and show some alternate form of ID because everything inside the building is so sensitive that you don't want to make the mistake of letting in an unauthorized person or is it more just sort of a general security thing and you're better off not um, impeding the people who are likely okay to come into the building and so you err on, on letting uh, a few people in who maybe didn't actually um, meet the standard. And those kinds of decisions are case by case, use case specific, risk specific, um, and are, there's no single answer for any of that. We read about things like police departments using these systems and having settings set at some particular level. Sometimes that might be because of the quality of the photo that's collected. So if the uh, picture of a suspect is off of a security tape of some kind and is by definition pretty low quality, they're turned, they're, it's dark, they have a hat on, whatever it might be, um, you're going to have to allow for some, some lower thresholds to get any sort of matching to occur. But that means then that the training of the people using that system has to be rigorous and sufficient so that they understand what that means is that they are by definition going to get people as uh, matched output recommendations that are very likely not that person and that it should only be used for sort of a general screening tool to maybe try to narrow down 
or uh, come up with a list of possibles, but that there needs to be a whole lot of um, expectation that these are very likely to be errors and that you don't make decisions based on that or use that in any way definitively um, when you can't have the reliability level that you need to have. So having said all that about the system themselves, what are the privacy concerns here? Obviously, as with any collection of data on us as individuals, we are worried about the security of the data, the profiling that that data might be used for, um, what it's being connected to in terms of other data about us. Is it giving us access to something? Is it being combined with things? Uh, for example, your health data, uh, your education record, your employment data, whatever other kinds of information, um, your purchasing data an advertiser might have about you. Um, and mostly the combination of those things put together uh, that then tie back to some sort of profiling that might be used either without your knowledge or uh, used in ways that you did not expect. So it's important for any government or private sector organization that wants to use something like a facial recognition system to take the privacy seriously up front and make sure that they're aware of these concerns in advance and take the measures from the start to put preventive policies in place or controls in place for the use of these systems, such as what I just addressed with the law enforcement example of making sure that you have very uh, highly trained personnel and that the systems are being used appropriately for the purpose of that particular case and not being used for recommendations or final judgments or final outcomes um, that are going to impact people um, in a very serious sense, in a criminal justice sense, but even in a commercial sense for advertising outputs and things like that. Um, taking those privacy considerations into um, consideration. So one of the ways to do this, of course, is a privacy impact assessment, similar to what we do with any sort of privacy system or a data system, collecting information on individuals and uh, considering how the information is going to be used, who's going to have access to it, how it's going to be shared, what controls are going to be put in place, and what rights the person has to correct, uh, access, delete, update or um, otherwise interact with the data that's being collected on them. Some of these issues are unique to facial recognition or at least fairly unique to facial recognition. Even as a biometric, it stands out a little bit in its own category in that it is um, the one that is generally collected passively. Now you may be fully engaged on the enrollment process if it's particularly in a verification scenario where you are opting in and intentionally doing this. This could be something like on a video game system where you um, sit still long enough for it to collect your face scan over the period of eight or 10 minutes to create your own personalized avatar. Um, you are aware that that's happening at that point. So passive doesn't necessarily mean that you don't know, but it can mean that uh, activity collection is happening without your knowledge in certain environments or in certain places. Um, and what are the implications of that? And that's where we get into the discussion that policymakers are having about government surveillance or just public surveillance, anonymity in public, um, obscurity, the right to sort of be in public and be seen, but maintain some level of obscurity as well. And that those are all of the uh, concerns that would need to be addressed. We have a lot of rules about microphones. We don't allow um, open mics just sitting out everywhere, being able to collect what people say. There are laws that require either one party or two party consent to tape a conversation. Um, we require the government to get warrants of different kinds and levels depending on what information they want to collect in a criminal sense. And so the question is, do we need similar sorts of boundaries and guidance for facial recognition systems? Uh, the answer to that might be yes, it might be no, it might be different sets of boundaries. We've seen already that there are municipalities who have chosen to ban government use of facial recognition at all um, because of concerns like this. That is certainly one of the possible policy outcomes. Uh, and then there are other places that are uh, perhaps trying to, to uh, take a more um, between, between the extremes example and figure out ways to use it, but use it in a protected way or use it in a limited way so that people are not um, threatened by the, the policy implications or the tracking uh, options. Um, opt-in versus opt-out carries some interesting implications for facial recognition. Um, we tend to sometimes think that an opt-out process is a, 
is an easy processor is a good option for a lot of data collection and, and use, and it certainly has its place. It's a little bit complicated in facial recognition because if your default is to scan as people come in, well, to use facial recognition, you're scan, you're by definition scanning everybody that walks in that comes through the scope of the camera. The question is, are you scanning them and comparing them against a database of people who have opted in? Meaning, if there's a match, then you've now identified them and you're moving forward with goods and services and features available to those customers? Or are you scanning it against a database of people who have opted out? Which, if you are, that's fine. You've opted pe offered people an opt-out option, but what that means is you've kept a database of the facial templates of the people who want to opt out of a facial recognition service. So there's a little bit of a, you know, cognitive dissonance there in the actual technology of making that work for an opt-out. And then there's the um, sort of social and, and uh, psychological impact of uh, the idea that we're using our face as a measure of our identity and a way to verify our identity and what that really means to us as individuals. Our face is, is, occupies a, a very unique space in our sense of self and who we are and how we identify ourselves and that makes it a little different even from other biometrics in particular as opposed to like iris or face, uh, fingerprint or things like that. Um, also, it is in fact right there out in the open for everybody um, and, and makes it a little different than something that, you know, the average person can't memorize your fingerprint or memorize your um, iris pattern or anything like that. And of course, there's this concept of you can't change your face, barring crazy makeup or masks or plastic surgery. The actual practical impact for most of us is that we're going to walk around with the face that we have most of the time and we don't want to feel like that that's some kind of vulnerability for us in terms of other people being able to collect information on us, match it to other data they might have, or in some other way profile us uh, and use that as a, a information imbalance or power imbalance in any kind of relationship. So um, one of the impacts of this that I mentioned earlier is the nature of the software itself and the proprietary aspects is that um, a breach of one set of data doesn't necessarily mean your face has been compromised. It may have been compromised for that system or that software, and even then, maybe not, depending on what the data was that was stolen. Um, but there is the ability to um, update the algorithms, shift to different vendors, change providers, and things like that. So, so it's not an all or nothing deal, is my point. Not trying to minimize the impact of a breach by any means, or the sensitivity of having your facial data collected and used in some way. Um, but just trying to put it in context of the, the reality is that there are ins and outs of that. So the last point on that is um, to discuss the options. If we're considering a facial recognition system, um, what would be the, the reasons to adopt one versus not? And what um, benefits might you be able to get from a facial recognition platform? So pretty much by definition, any collection of personal personal information by a technology system should be justified. You should need to do it to provide the goods and services that is um, the core of the exchange, and it should be the best and most efficient way to do it. The traditional privacy principles of data minimization and purpose and use should apply. You should only be collecting the data that you need and only for the purposes that you need to use it for, uh, again, to provide the service that, you're, that you are using. So, any new system, including a, a biometric one, with implications for personal data and privacy, um, should consider some sort of set of, of established guidelines to evaluate when and where to adopt that system. One of the examples, this is a, a four-part test that was first proposed in Canada. It's, um, you know, it's not definitive, but it's a good example. Um, and it's from a, a Supreme Court case in Canada that says to weigh the appropriateness of a potentially privacy invasive measure, you should have four questions. Is the measure demonstrably necessary to meet a specific need? Is it likely to be effective in meeting that need? Would the loss of privacy be proportionate to the benefit gained? And is there a less privacy invasive way of achieving the same end? Um, this is not particular to facial recognition. This is just a technology evaluative structure generally, but I think it works just as well here. You could add some questions or nuance to make it particular to facial recognition. You have to define what is necessary in that sense when is, uh, if you need to be able to identify people individually, there are ways to do that besides facial recognition. What would make facial recognition sort of outweigh the others in terms of either efficiency, benefit, speed, cost, or whatever the other aspects might be compared to uh, what the alternatives might be. 
So there was a case in the EU recently where a school was using a facial recognition system to take attendance. And uh, the European court came back and said, no, there was absolutely no justification for that. There are a lot of ways to take attendance in a classroom without needing to use facial recognition to do it. And the privacy implications of using a facial recognition system on students and maintaining that database and maintaining that data in that context was sort of ridiculously out of proportion to the, to the value given of you know, having them sign in or using a student ID card or having the teachers take role or whatever the other alternatives might be. By contrast, there was another case where uh, uh, ARENA wanted to use facial recognition system outside the arena as part of a security measure to identify some, uh, to enroll in the database that they were comparing against some sort of known um, uh, demonstrators who came to the arena and frequently provoked fights or incidents or other issues in terms of security and safety around the arena. Um, they used the facial recognition to help identify the presence of those particular individuals early so that uh, security folks could come and intervene in an effective and hopefully efficient way, prevent impact on other visitors to the arena, and also uh, maintain the security of that event. And the European Court in that case said that was in fact a very justifiable use of a facial recognition system. Um, and that, I don't know if they said very, but they said it was a justifiable use of a facial recognition system and that, that was an example of a proportionate value for what, was being, uh, what it was being used for. So <clears throat> one of the primary things that I think that we see a lot in technology right now is this concept that because we can do something, we want to do it. And in a privacy frame of mind, um, no systems should be implemented or supported simply because it's feasible. Just because we can use these kinds of systems in certain kinds of ways is not uh, the de facto answer that we should. And so um, not here to say what the particular policy answer is in any particular use case, just that that is an important question and it needs to be answered by the stakeholders in general, not only the business or the government agency or the other organization seeking to implement the facial recognition system, but also with the input and understanding and awareness of the people who are going to be impacted by it and how what their um, responses might be. All biometric systems involve some compromise of privacy, just as all data collection systems do um, when it's stored and used for any purpose. So it's just whether the question is, um, it's, the question is whether it's a, a fair trade-off for the value gained um, and sufficiently understood by the people that are being uh, impacted. The alternatives, of course, we know that there's many other ways to track people's location, track their presence, track their behavior. Um, one of the th concerns that we sometimes have, at, um, or at least that I have it, in dealing with facial recognition software systems is that people get so focused on the fact that we're being tracked or profiled via a facial recognition system that they forget that if we don't use a facial recognition system, those same outputs can still occur. So one of the things I think is uh, another important takeaway is not to get so focused on the threat of this particular technology that we sort of lose sight of what it's a threat to, which is to say generalized surveillance or tracking or profiling, and that there are other ways to do that. And we want to make sure we continue to look at that whole set of risks and concerns, even if facial recognition is not part of that process. Um, so the alternatives that exist may be a better privacy friendly way. Maybe there's RFID cards. Maybe there's um, some sort of app check-in. Uh, maybe there's just a different biometric that would be a little bit less invasive um, and still meet the same needs for uh, verification and identification that facial recognition services would provide. If a facial recognition system is uh, proposed and justified and implemented, it certainly needs to be done so in a way that takes privacy into account at all the stages throughout that process. Um, I kind of flipped forward a little bit prematurely here, I think, but um, last couple of things are another couple of techniques to make it a little more privacy friendly or safer is to in fact focus on verification systems versus identification systems. Um, where you're matching the one-to-one -one versus the one-to-many. Also to explore the alternatives of, of ways to implement the system. So things like local storage of the image that you're matching against, um, on-device storage versus cloud storage, 
And that's not a categorical statement that cloud storage is bad and on-device is good because that may not always be the case. It's just to say that those are some of the questions that should be asked and those are some of the considerations that may make a system both um, safer, more secure from breaches or, or security threats, also more privacy protective for the individuals involved. Privacy is fundamentally about awareness, choice, and control. And to uh, enjoy your privacy or to be able to take security in your privacy, take confidence in your privacy um, means that you need to be able to feel like you have the choice over what personal information you reveal, to whom, and why. Uh, biometric systems are one of the ways to manage this, and this sensitive information is sometimes collected in significant amounts, so people need to understand what the implications are. Government institutions, private organizations, commercial entities all need to think about these when they're proposing initiatives that call for the collection or disclosure of biometric information. So the challenge is to design, implement, and operate a system holistically that actually improves identification services without compromising privacy. Uh, organizations have choices at all levels and in all contexts, and so they need to focus on making sure they make the right one. So now I will stop for, uh, I think, a short period of questions just to clarify anything that I've said or anything that, that um, might have been unclear, and then uh, I'll turn it over to Patrick. Any questions either online or you know, from the folks viewing remotely or in the room? So Brenda, let me ask you one question um, in order to try to kick off. Perhaps people are feeling a little bit, little bit shy this morning, whether or not in the room or remotely. No, I was just that clear. Um, <laughs> I was just that <laughs> Thank you precise. for that. That's wonderful. Um, so how would you say that privacy experts are going to help to lead in terms of guiding the development of facial recognition uh, technology in the future? Uh, so I think that, that privacy experts play the same role that they do in a lot of the, the processes and systems that they're managing already and that we're seeing already. And in some of the ways that I referred to is that the fundamental privacy protections and concerns are still the same for biometrics and facial recognition technology. Uh, is it appropriate for its use? Are we collecting the data? Uh, are we minimizing the data collection appropriately? Um, obviously, some of the concerns that come up with facial recognition are things like what we're reading in the news about public data sets of images being collected when that, that was never what those images were there for. So public scraping of websites, um, things like that have implications. And the uh, suppliers of those data sets as well as the users of those data sets probably need to think uh, pretty carefully and ask some, some fairly careful questions about whether that's in fact an appropriate use of that data, even if it is at this point not necessarily legally prohibited, um, whether that's uh, appropriate. Okay. Thank you very much, Brenda. So I want to get to our questions that are coming in um, from the chat, if you don't mind taking questions from sort of the remote over here. I'm a little disappointed that I wasn't that clear, but okay, if there's an actual question. Well, thank you very much. So um, we have two questions. So first, um, what would you say are the benefits of an opt-in versus opt-out regime for facial recognition? Well, for example, at FPF, we put out some privacy principles for facial recognition systems and commercial applications about a year and a half ago, and our strong recommendation is for an opt-in express consent only for any commercial applications. So this is to say that, you know, in a say like the, the hospitality industry, if you want to be able to check into your conference uh, using facial recognition or check into your hotel or pick up your rental car or any of the other kinds of things that might be made faster and easier and more frictionless by using a biometric system, one of which would be facial recognition, um, there are people who want those advantages and, and conveniences and there's you know, nothing really wrong with offering them, but that clearly, in our opinion, should be an opt-in. Um, where the people who want it do, and the people who don't want it um, don't, uh, you know, are not sort of forced to take part in that um, or to opt out if that's the default. Whereas I described, that data would have to be collected. Um, opt in or uh, opt out may have its place in other categories. Right now, um, the U.S. government uses facial recognition in um, its control of exit visas. At, is in test at several airports right now, and that is on an opt-out basis because um, in that context for, they have made the decision that the default will be that everybody is in uh, participating in that, but um, you do have the option to opt out of that, uh, and that notice is provided in various places um, throughout that system, signage in other places. So I think it's use case specific. I don't, um, 
I think there's ever an all or nothing right answer as to whether opt-out or opt-in is better. Um, but in certain cases, I think it's clear one sort of carries the, the, the better uh, model uh, than the other. All right. Thank you very much, Brenda. So while we're <coughs> taking a couple more um, questions here on the chat, I wanted to tee up one that'll help us to make the transition between your presentation and that from uh, Patrick Garther, who from NIST. Um, and that question comes from Lauren, who's asking, are privacy experts participating in global standard setting organization? And if so, which ones um, that you're aware of? Um, hmm. So that's a really good question. I, I am probably going to defer some of that to Patrick. <laughs> Obviously, in, in the US, the um, uh, NIST is not uh, setting standards, as I'm sure he'll, he'll probably say when he gets up here, but they are um, evaluating uh, systems for what, stand for what level of accuracy they meet. And um, what standard is necessary in any particular context would also change. I do know that there are people at ACM and IEEE and those kinds of standard settings bodies that are very interested in this um, sort of question, um, but I can't really speak for them in terms of what actual projects or programs they might have to set those. I think a lot of it, again, from a policy or legislative point of view, would be less about setting a particular standard as a number because that's so easily outdated very quickly and more about um, sort of a values-based uh, protection of levels of accuracy or um, false positives or false negatives and what the risks of each might be. Thank you very much, Brenda. So for those of you who are participating in our online um, discussion, we're going to make the transition from Brenda, um, thank you very much, to Patrick coming in from the US National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Those of you who have asked your questions here in the chat but haven't had them answered yet, please do know we will be taking uh, your questions down and we'll refer them to the Q&A for both panelists here at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, Patrick. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the FPF for inviting me here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about face recognition. Uh, I work for the US Department of Commerce uh, in a non-regulatory and non-policy agency. Uh, what we do do is quantitative support for standardization. We don't set standards themselves, typically. Uh, we provide data to allow consensus industry standards to be made. Uh, and I'll walk you through some of the things that we've done. Um, in face recognition. Uh, what is face recognition? As Brenda pointed out, there's two sort of dominant uses for this technology, one-to-one -one verification and one-to-many search. So two pairs of images here and the fundamental core biometric operation. You could do this with fingerprints, you could do with this iris, you could do this with voice recognition. Here we're doing it with face recognition you have to determine, an algorithm has to determine, or a human has to determine, whether the faces on the left are from the same person or not, and the faces on the right are from the same person or not. And this is difficult for a human if you don't know the people involved. Um, so uh, in this case, that is me, two different photos taken a couple of years apart. And on the right, that is uh, my colleague and her sister. Um, so with uh, some shared genetics there. Um, the capability of humans to do this uh, was tested and reported in a, a, a PNAS paper um, a couple of years ago, and they used 20 pairs of images. These are two of those pairs. And you can see in this case that uh, now there's some quality problems. Uh, we've got some blur, we've got some uh, non-uniform illumination because the photo was taken outside. And we get a hint now that things actually get a bit more difficult. Uh, you can always uh, undermine face recognition by degrading the quality of the photograph. And we'll get to that again. So there's, without testing the audience here, uh, that is the, the actual answers uh, to that test. Now, there are two kinds of errors that face recognition systems make. And uh, this is... They are tasked with saying same person or not. Compare two photos, answer the question same person or not. If you falsely declare that two people are the same when they're not, that's a false positive. If you say that one person is a different person from two different photographs, that's a false negative. This is the kind of decision uh, apparatus that we do all the time. A radiologist would look at a CT scan and say cancer or not. Uh, a medical test would look at a coronavirus sample and say coronavirus or not. Uh, 
uh, on a battlefield, you would take a photograph maybe of some trees and you would say, is there a tank in there or not? This is decision theory, false positives, false negatives. The consequences of those mistakes are, are, are application dependent, heavily application dependent. One-to-many identification, in contrast, uh, well, let, let's go back and let's just say that uh, you can use one-to-one -one verification as a US passport holder by, uh, in e-gates in Heathrow Airport in London, in the airport in Sydney. You walk up to a machine, you present the passport, the machine does, takes a photograph, compares with the passport image, and either lets you in or not. So you can walk across the border quite easily. Uh, using such systems, and false positives can occur, false negatives can occur. Uh, that is a two-step process. There's a passport that needs to be read. The possession of a passport is a security factor. And there's the biometric operation. In contrast, you can, you can uh, as Brenda just mentioned, you can uh, leave the United States now uh, as an immigrant and record your biometric exit from the United States. As a, as a visa holder. And you do that by walking up to a camera. You can do this at Dulles Airport on the KLM flight to Amsterdam. Uh, you walk up to the camera and you board the plane or not. And that records your biometric exit if it's successful. Uh, you could try boarding such a plane uh, as somebody else and try to induce a false positive. The false positive rate, the, false, the consequences of that would be different from a false negative. A false negative you would go see the airline staff and they would probably board you anyway with the traditional process. But that kind of activity is a one-to-many search uh, and it's probably the bigger market segment for face recognition uh, technology today. Um, so again, two kinds of errors. If you're in the database and the algorithm doesn't return you, that's a false negative. And uh, the, the other case is if you're not in the database and the algorithm does return you, that's a false positive. And that happened now with a very old system, 2011 in Boston in the driving license uh, domain. Um, the algorithms are working in this case by essentially doing n one-to-one -one comparisons. So if you've got a database with say 50 entities in it, you would do 50 one-to-one -one comparisons. And if they all come back no, you would say the person's not in the database. If any of them come back yes, you would say they are in the database. That's how some face recognition algorithms work in this one-to-many segment. Um, uh, and so examples of this technology are uh, in, say, a casino. This is a new growth part of the business. Uh, you might have compulsive gamblers self-nominating self themselves to be in the database. You might have a uh, high roller rich people who are put into a database. The consequences of false negatives and false positives in those two cases are different. So if the casino would have a very high interest in having a high roller walk into their casino and, and treating them well, compulsive gambler, maybe they don't care so much. Uh, so you, you might run two different searches against two different databases. Um, so that's, a, that's an example of the, the use of this technology. So, how does FR work in brief? And uh, Brenda covered some of this. But what we've got is essentially a comparison of two photos. And uh, the algorithms that are, uh, are fielded don't know anything about Patrick, the images here. They are generic extractors of identity information from photographs. So two photos go in. The same apparatus extracts what's called a feature vector uh, of identity information and puts them into a comparator. And the comparator says, essentially, it renders a score, it says how similar the two faces are. If that's a high score, you might accept that as a decision to say, yes, it's the same person. If it's a low score, you might accept that as a decision to say it's a different person. Those feature vectors are proprietary, as Brenda said. They are Face recognition is, involves some quite high-end intellectual property. It's not a commodity uh, operation. Uh, capability across the industry varies substantially. And the feature vectors that are being used are very, uh, they're just a, a set of numbers. Uh, they don't mean much just if you were to inspect these numbers, but they mean a lot to the, uh, to the comparison algorithm that uses these things. They vary in length from a few dozen to a few hundred uh, 
uh, numbers. Um, they are not usually generated with any specific claim to be irreversible. So if you sit down a PhD with a collection of these feature vectors, they would eventually reconstruct something that would look like uh, a face image. Now, it wouldn't be a good rendition of a face, but it might be useful in terms of being able to use that identity in another system. And there are schemes that have been evaluated in the, in the, in the academic literature for formally protecting face templates with some claim of cryptographic non-reversibility. And uh, uh, those schemes haven't really been evaluated very well to date. Um, most of the contemporary face recognition algorithms are built on neural networks, convolutional neural networks. They are uh, a set of different layered architectures. What goes into the neural network is the pixel data from the face, uh, red, green, blue color channels. Uh, they go into these various convolutional operations where small parts of the image are scanned and, uh, and weighted and push through nonlinear functions in a, in a big stack. What comes out of that is a vector. And that vector is the feature vector, the identity vector, which can be compared with other identity vectors of other people or the same person. It's a composed function. It's nonlinear. How these things work uh, in detail and why they produce what they do is, a, is, an, is a, a research subject in and of itself. The issue of explainable AI. Why did two faces match? And that is a, that's a research issue. Uh, face recognition has uh, seen a, an industrial revolution recently um, because of very large numbers of uh, images being available, at least historically, on the internet. Uh, many developers would have scraped the web for open data sets and would uh, uh, have used those for training an algorithm. Um, uh, many tools were available, uh, GPUs were available, uh, very powerful computers that allow these things uh, to be trained. Uh, training is, is not typically done in a commercial operation. Training happens at the developer's uh, uh, laboratory, the product gets productized, it then gets shipped, and it is rarely trained on customer data. The developers have an interest in doing that, but it's not really a turnkey operation. Uh, that training uh, is done back in the lab. Uh, the, the developers would like to be able to train, particularly on large customers' databases, but it typically doesn't happen. There are policy consequences, privacy consequences, and, uh, and it's not a turnkey operation. So uh, face recognition algorithms get shipped. Uh, they get used. They are essentially uh, fixed installation, maybe a, an on-site engineer would, uh, would tweak the software, sort of parameterize the software, but not really retrain it. Now, image quality matters, as, as I said earlier. Uh, the industry has been built largely on this consensus industry standard. Uh, this regulates what goes on your driving license and on your passport pretty much worldwide. And the, the, the standards bodies that defined this, this, this image format, this, this appearance format, have various uh, guidance to, to operators on, not, on how not to take a photograph. But these example photographs here are really quite trivial deviations from the standard. They would fail a State Department test, uh, hopefully, uh, and they wouldn't make it onto a passport uh, for the various reasons. Um, but Face recognition uh, has been used. Uh, uh, there's a very, very wide spectrum, essentially an open-ended spectrum of image quality. And certain uh, entities around the world would like to be able to recognize photographs on the right side of this spectrum. So you could conceive of an intelligence agency somewhere taking a photograph with a long lens outdoors, maybe uh, you know, with, in the dark, and you would get uh, a photograph that wasn't very good. And can a re an algorithm recognize that? Well, in principle, yes, but eventually, no. We can always turn the lights out completely, get a very dark image, and there's no signal. With no signal, you get no recognition. Um, 
the, the, the applications are sort of split uh, by these blue arrows here into sort of cooperative, where somebody is making a deliberate presentation to a camera. That's the, the big part of the industry. But also this non-cooperative case, where maybe you're just walking down the jetway onto a plane and somebody takes a photograph of you. Maybe you're walking out in uh, the out outdoors in Washington, D.C., and somebody takes a photograph of you without any cooperation. Uh, typically, you'll get better quality on the left side, lower quality on the right side. Uh, eventually, uh, face recognition will fail with the kinds of images that are sort of featured on the right side there. And that's an open-ended spectrum. Now, uh, quality problems, what that causes, if you think of a face recognition algorithm as a similarity measuring device, you take a photograph of me and another photograph of me, it measures the similarity between the two photographs. And you get a distribution of the similarity scores. Low scores would uh, occur when you've got image quality problems. And you can see severe image quality problems on the, on the left side there. A low score would also occur under aging. So we can moisturize, we can try and look after ourselves, but eventually things go wrong and we don't look like ourselves. Uh, so, and we end up looking as similar to ourselves as other people do to us. And that is the overlap in these two score distributions and that's where false positives and false negatives come from. Aging, injury, uh, disease, uh, drug use, image quality problems will all degrade face recognition uh, and we get problems. I will skip this slide. So NIST runs the face recognition vendor test. Uh, we've done this for 20 years. It has got four different components at the moment, a test of one-to-one -one capability, the larger market segment, one-to-many capability. We published a report on that just yesterday, uh, an update to a September report. We've also got a track for quality assessment. Can you look at an image and say it's a good image? We have a thing for morph detection, which is a particular attack on face recognition algorithms. In the, uh, the box number seven on the right there, uh, as colleagues are doing this, uh, how well the humans do face recognition. In the past, we've looked at video surveillance. Uh, we've looked at age estimation and sex estimation from a single photograph. In the future, we may look at presentation attack detection. We're likely to do that, how well the algorithms work in that case. There's a couple of uh, activities that we may also do, template protection. This is the class of algorithms that claim to produce uh, non-reversible templates and unlinkable templates. How well do they work? Uh, De-identification, can we damage an image in some calibrated way such that an image is good for verification, but not good for large-scale identification. There are companies in that space today. We may also do age estimation again. Uh, the, the, the tests that we run are confined to just the algorithm. Uh, we don't really have people walking around uh, in front of cameras. Cameras can make a difference. This is a slide from DHS. We've got the same individuals there, four different individuals imaged by three different cameras. Camera matters, and particularly, you know, DHS, I think, conducted this study because they're interested in imaging people quickly for transition through an airport. Uh, if you image people quickly, then maybe you would induce uh, quality problems. That's part of the, part of the recognition pipeline. Uh, there is uh, a law enforcement use case, which is very common for face recognition, where you would search somebody against the database, and the algorithm would be configured to just produce candidate identities. It would find the most similar people in the database, and it would, re uh, it would rely on a human to look at the candidates and say, is it the same person or not? Is that person actually in the database? And they may not be. Uh, so a system then is defined by the combined automated and human uh, components. Uh, a huge industry, I will skip this. Some companies have participated in our tests, upwards of 100 different developers. Some developers, famous companies, have not. They don't need to, they can run their own tests. And others have just elected not to participate. We cannot compel participation in our evaluations. Um, now, a demonstration of how effective the technology is, and that is to produce a database on the left side there of 100 million photographs of 32 million people. That's 
bigger than Texas, a bit smaller than California, uh, and you enroll maybe about three photographs on average per person into a database. We did this with two recognition algorithms, which I'll show you the results on the next slide, but we searched that with essentially pristine photographs of the type shown on the right. The photographs on the left are definitely substandard. They have pose, illumination, expression, cropping problems. Uh, and so uh, they were considered historically a big challenge to face recognition uh, a few years ago, but they're not anymore. This is a result for two different algorithms, two different developers in, uh, that uh, are prominent in the industry, NEC and rank one. The number there in red is the best performance that we got on that task. So you're going to search a database of 100 million photographs, and 0.4% of the time, you don't find the correct identity in that database. That is a miss rate. Uh, that's what the law enforcement folks would call that, um, and the 99.6% hit rate. Uh, that's pretty remarkable, pretty profound, that you can search a database of 30 million people, all of California, almost, uh, with a single photograph, a single substandard photograph, and get uh, get the correct response. So that is a testament to the invariance properties of convolutional neural networks, that they see through quality problems, they extract identity information, and they will search through a large database. Um, there's been a massive expansion of the industry. The leading developers in the world are from China, Russia, the United States, and Japan. Uh, the algorithms are very accurate. They are increasingly tolerant of poor quality. But uh, similarity scores can be low when we, degrade, uh, when we degrade quality and through aging. And that uh, induces failures. False positives and false negatives are real. Um, we produced a report uh, last December about demographic effects in face recognition. So are error rates in different populations different? And uh, our attention was drawn to this by a, a, a case not involving face recognition, but involving quality assessment. And the New Zealand passport office rejected this gentleman for having his eyes closed. Clearly an algorithmic issue that falsely rejected uh, a passport applicant. Um, Georgetown wrote their famous report. Uh, this drew a lot of attention uh, uh, to the issue and the consequences uh, and the circumstances around differential error rates and, and what that would mean. Uh, similarly, uh, MIT looked at uh, face classification algorithms, not really recognition algorithms, and they found out that uh, these particular cloud-based algorithms uh, didn't uh, recognize uh, African-American or African females very well. Uh, this sort of got conflated with face recognition uh, Face analysis of the kind that MIT studied is really just a single shot. A single image goes in, the, the, the black box neural network uh, is saying male or female. That is different to what I showed you before, which is this uh, generic uh, extractor of identity information. Uh, nevertheless, the, the MIT study was, a, was a, 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 a cautionary tale that algorithms can be biased, that there's something going wrong in certain demographics. So we undertook uh, a study, and our study uh, looked at just these red boxes here. So we were looking at verification and identification. We were quantifying false positive rates and false negative rates for different demographic groups. Uh, certainly other places where bias could occur uh, is covered by this slide. Who you put in a database, the quality assessment function, the feature extraction function, do you even enroll people into a database? Uh, and the human review on the, on the right side. That itself could be biased. We used many, many algorithms from many developers. We did one-to-many, one-to-one. We made a, a, a very uh, sort of strenuous point that we're quantifying false positives and false negatives. And that had been lost on particularly a lot of press coverage and some academic coverage of this, uh, of this discussion. We used data, data sets from four different US government agencies uh, that data resides in a lab in my organization that I've never been in. Uh, we're sort of privileged to have this data. It affords us the ability to, run, to test face recognition algorithms. Um, so in a one-to-one -one verification case, if you compare people on the left side from 
different demographics. Uh, a, a young Asian female with General Eisenhower, an old white male, uh, you'll get different results than if on the right side if you compare two individuals from the same demographics who happen to be both former presidents of the United States. So, so that concept that we would get higher scores on the right side from people in the same demographic uh, than on the left side from a different demographic it shouldn't be controversial. But you don't expect to get that from fingerprints and you don't expect that to get, to get that from iris recognition. You might get it from voice recognition. There's no real consensus on that in the industry. But it happens in face recognition. And if you compare photos of different people from different ages uh, of the same sex, uh, you get this figure here. Now, red is showing that in the bottom left-hand corner that very young individuals give you high false positive rates. That's almost like saying that babies look the same. That is not quite a controversial statement for that demographic. But if it, you also see that on the top right-hand corner that elderly people look the same. In the eyes of this algorithm, higher false positive rates. Now, why this occurs, why any of this occurs, is not really known. Our report didn't do cause and effect analysis. That's uh, a, an active topic. But we reported this data, and some of these effects are quite large. And I'll move on to this figure, which was probably the most prominent uh, figure in the demographics report. And what this is showing is for 24 different countries in seven different regions of the world, we compared photos, good photos, of different people. Uh, and so at the top left, we've got people from Vietnam being compared with people from Poland. And they give very low false positive rates. The algorithm doesn't associate those people as being very similar. But on the diagonal here, from bottom left to top right, we see in the top right-hand corner, for this algorithm from Imperial College London, uh, we see a bright red blob saying that people from various countries in East Asia are giving you high false positive rates. In the bottom left corner, we see gray values from Russia, Ukraine, and Poland, saying the al this algorithm gives you nominal false positive rates, lower false positive rates for uh, what, in this case, I think it's all male, uh, for white males, or predominantly white males. And you can see in the middle, there's some bright red dots. And it turns out that if you're an operator of a passport e-gate, the kind that's installed at Heathrow Airport, uh, they target a false positive rate for verification of inbound travelers of about 1 in 40,000. So something like the bottom left-hand corner there. But as you can see, the, uh, the false positive rates in these various demographic groups are, um, uh, have very big excursions from that nominal rate. Now, this was a surprise to the developers that I spoke to who operate these gates, who ship these gates the magnitude of this effect. And by analogy with a four-digit pin, you've got something a bit better than a four-digit pin in the bottom left-hand corner. But in the center there, you've got something like a two-digit pin. So from a security perspective, this is an unwelcome kind of outcome. This just applies to one-to-one -one recognition. Uh, the false positive rates are higher in females. They're higher in the elderly and the young, as I said. And it varies by algorithm. You can't say face recognition is biased on the basis of just this figure. It applies to one algorithm. Now, most installations of face recognition worldwide only use one algorithm. They don't use a pool of algorithms. They don't use 20 algorithms. They use one. So a, a key takeaway from the report, a key sort of recommendation from the report, was for users of algorithms to know their algorithm, to know the demographic sensitivities and other sensitivities to things like image quality, to things like aging. So this is an algorithm developed in Shanghai. This company disclosed that they trained the algorithm on 500 million photos from a Chinese dating website. There's obviously a, a lot of dating going on in China, well, uh, until recently maybe. And uh, this algorithm doesn't show the pronounced block structure uh, that uh, the, the previous algorithm did. So this would support the conjecture that training data matters, that 
different algorithms trained on primarily Western data may not handle African, Asian populations very well. Now that's a jump to this idea of cause and effect, what's actually causing this, but this is a sort of a hint that algorithms developed in Asia don't give you these high false positives on Asian faces. Not all algorithms developed in China do this. Some, some do, some don't. So again, know your algorithm, know what you're getting into. Now there's a sort of forgotten demographic here, and this is twins. And it turns out that uh, identical twins uh, are essentially not distinguishable by contemporary face recognition algorithms. So I spoke to a, a twin yesterday, just by surprise, I was talking about face recognition. She said, I'm a twin. And she asked me, can I use my sister's passport? <laughs> and I said, I'm not gonna you know, recommend that you commit a felony, but the face recognition algorithm would probably work. So, uh, and as evidence of that, now twins are becoming more common uh, for various reasons. Uh, they are quite common, 3% of live births in 2015. The CDC tracks uh, this kind of data very well, big reports on this every year. Uh, so what we did is we enrolled one of the twins in a database of size 1.6 million, and then we searched the other twin against it. And three different algorithms here, pretty much all algorithms would do this, would put the twin at rank one in that search. Now that twin shouldn't be on that list at all. If you did this with iris recognition or fingerprint recognition, you wouldn't expect to get this behavior. But we do with face, and the reason for that is genetics. These people look very, very similar. Face recognition algorithms are similarity measuring devices. Uh, similarly with fraternal twins, uh, one of the algorithms puts uh, the, the, the sister, in this case, down at rank 11, but two of the algorithms will report this at rank one. Again, not ideal behavior, but here the scores are actually quite weak. So even though the, the mate is at rank one, the sister is at rank one, uh, the score is weak. So this might be rejected in, say, a casino application or a passport duplicate detection application. Uh, this is my colleague May and her sister, also weak scores, but again, uh, the sister is prominently up the candidate list. Now, uh, 2004, an algorithm was advanced by a French company that looked at skin texture. And the skin texture, it, it, it appears, is not genetically linked. And if you can see that skin texture, if you've got enough resolution on a photograph to use that skin texture, then twins can be disambiguated. But that is typically not done in face recognition today because the photos typically don't have enough resolution, despite the fact that cameras today can collect such resolution. So the summary of the demographics thing is that genetics is causing false positives, uh, or it's implicated in that. Uh, the twins studies imply that. Uh, leading contemporary algorithms are very accurate, they tolerate poor quality, but they generally distribute errors inequitably across demographics. Now there's an important exception to that, and that is that some identification algorithms are stabilizing an imposter distribution such that false positive rates are equal across demographics. And the report includes that. And that's an advantage for those algorithms that do it, but it's a minority of algorithms. The algorithm matters, demographic sensitivity matters, know your algorithm, the application matters, the consequences of an error, a false positive or a false negative, uh, could be grave or they could be essentially inconsequential. Uh, there's a, a section in the report that we wrote on reporting. And that reporting, we, we advocate for reporting of both false positive and false negative and the size of the database where, uh, where in the, the, the sort of the, the chain of operations the errors are occurring. So, um, yeah, and that's what that slide is about. Uh, I probably won't go through it in uh, favor of uh, talking to you about some Q&A. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. That was very enlightening and very interesting um, to try to see the many ways in which these things have been resolved. So we're going to move to a joint uh, Q&A discussion with our panelists. If you're interested in uh, purchasing, let's say, facial recognition systems, 
what are the standards that we have to look into when evaluating of vendors? So there's no, no formal standards, uh, procurement lists. I think there's been efforts from a governance perspective to, to write down things that you should think about, privacy implications, protection of the data, retention of the data, these kinds of things. But my organization certainly hasn't written standards on minimum accuracy levels or minimum speed levels. Um, we don't do that because uh, a lot of the applications that we try and support uh, have their own requirements. So our, our reports produce you know, a look at the technical performance indicators without thresholding them, without saying this algorithm is good enough, because that is application dependent. Got another one coming in from the room. Patrick, uh, first of all, I wanted to say how fortunate commerce is and how fortunate our country is to have you as a civil service and a public servant uh, uh, with the expertise you have. So that's number one. Number two, uh, and in fact, the forums Amelia Vance has been working on this. Uh, there's a bandwagon going on with schools that are now putting in facial recognition for purposes of, we don't know, but generally for purposes of security, either to prevent events from occurring or trying to investigate events. How, first of all, how, uh, what is the research on this? And secondly, uh, is facial recognition the right way to go? Uh, certainly there are alternatives. So I think schools in the past have been equipped with fingerprint access control devices. Um, uh, if, if, the, if, if the objective here is access control, uh, then, then you know, face recognition is an option for that. Uh, I think you know, uh, children will be quite resourceful at circumventing these things. <laughs> Right? And, and any consideration of whether to do this would, would require consideration of how systems can be circumvented. So, uh, uh, you know, the, Brenda referred to this aspect of spoofing. So if you can hold up a photograph on a printed piece of paper to a camera and the door opens, uh, you know, that is an attack that you would, that it's, it's mandatory to kind of resist in that kind of setting, I would think. Um, uh, Children age quite quickly. Uh, we've produced some data on aging. Uh, the Australian uh, Defense Department, using Australian passport data, has produced very good data um, on how quickly children age and the error rates that you might encounter in children. Um, uh, the error rates have, have come down quite substantially. So from a, from a performance point of view, you can probably do it. Um, and, and maintain a low false positive rate. But active attack by resourceful kids is, is something that you would have to think about. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for our participants in the room. So I'll rejoin the uh, slides up here. So we have a couple of questions that were left over from our previous discussion, and, and we also have a few that were uh, came in as you spoke, Patrick. So one of the questions that was directed to Brenda, but was also asked to be directed to you, is how is it that people are participating, how is it that NIST, how is it that privacy experts are participating in the development of global standards? Yeah, so uh, I touch the, uh, the, the, the technical performance uh, st standardization. So I, I'm aware that in an organization called SC27, underneath ISO, ISO, IEC, JTC1, there's a standardization committee on security called SC27. And they have some projects uh, on uh, privacy protection and particularly template protection. So that is this idea that if you in, if you were enrolled in a biometric system uh, in two different places, that if somebody were to steal the templates from those two places, that you couldn't reverse them and produce an image, and you couldn't link them and find out that this person is enrolled somewhere else. Uh, and template protection, there's been a, a number of very interesting sort of mathematical schemes for protection of templates going back now 20 years. Uh, they, there are companies involved in that space uh, that typically it's sort of 
uh, it's not a large market segment, I think. Um, we are entertaining doing an evaluation of that and contributing data to SC27 in the in the, their standardization of this. Um, yeah, there's uh, another aspect, also a technical aspect, on de-identification. So can you selectively damage an image so that it can't be recognized or only partially recognized? Uh, and again, those algorithms uh, would be subject to evaluation. That's what we would do. But beyond that, um, sort of policy-wise, uh, I'm not the right person to comment on how biometrics should be collected, retained, uh, or maintained. Um, Okay, thank you very much. We have one question in the room here. So it's a combination, I guess, of a comment and question, but you do a great job, both of you, in laying out the technology and how it works. I think in some of the discussions I've had on the Hill, one of the shortcomings uh, is driven by underlying assumptions on the accuracy of matching. In particular, assumptions with regard to the accuracy with which individuals can do one-to-one -one matching or one-to-many matching. So when we look at the algorithms and you're coming out on at the best end of one-to-one -one matching at a 99.6 rate, the average person in this room is going to only be in the low 60s on the same one-to-one -one matching. If you frame the discussion a little more fully, by talking about some of the challenges on one-to-one -one matching or the upward limits of one-to-many matching. I mean, I don't know how many photos any of us could match against, but an algorithm can match against millions. I think it would help people to understand how the technology is an improvement over sort of the, the current practice because I think a lot of people are looking for perfection. And we're a long way from perfection, and we'll be a long way for quite a while. But incremental improvements are important, and this is much more than an incremental improvement over what the average person can do right now in a one-to-one -one or a one-to-many uh, scenario. I guess comments on that would be helpful. Okay, let's take a first stab at that. Um, so your, your point is very well made, and that is frequently something that's included in the conversation in terms of when you're talking about the, uh, some of the things I talked about at the end about justifying any particular system is what are the alternatives, and part of the alternatives is how accurate are they, how much they cost, how fast are they, and how accurate are they. And yes, humans are definitely not up there on the quality um, or speed scale for that compared to things like this. However, having said that, um, one of the, uh, dissections and the uh, considerations about facial recognition technology in terms of the uh, controversy is what are the problems with facial recognition if it doesn't work well and has demographic impacts that might be inequitable or um, unfair? What are the implications of facial recognition technology if it works perfectly? And those both cause concerns for people. So facial recognition working really well or working bad, better than humans or working better than passwords or working better than some other systems helps answer the if it doesn't work well question. So we, we know we can have systems that work pretty well along a lot of different metrics and measures, but then there are still questions about are there other concerns that those systems might engender then just in terms of um, surveillance or uh, social implications or um, data collection and availability that maybe we don't want to create um, at that level and scale and accuracy. Um, and I'm not here to say we do or we don't. The point is e each of those scenarios still has concerns attached, but it is important, as you've pointed out, to be in the right conversation at the right time in terms of what risks you're considering. So human capability varies. Some people have aptitude to do this. Some people don't. E evidence shows that. Um, the, the algorithms, I think, are, the, the good algorithms are, are, are performing better than humans. Now, it's, it's a bit difficult to prove that. Characterizing human performance is a bit of a slow process. So the tests that are being done uh, are, you know, take a few months to do. Um, they're 
typically done on small data sets, sort of dozens of, of pairs of images, for example. Uh, so characterizing human performance is, 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 is tricky. Uh, the Australian government has instituted aptitude tests for the people that it employs in the adjudication of pairs of images, in passport offices, I think in, in criminal contexts also. Uh, uh, those tests are, uh, are, are out there, and I think they're, they're being improved quite, quite slowly. But uh, I, you know, the, the, the good algorithms, uh, good algorithms uh, can identify pairs of faces quite a lot more readily and more quickly uh, than a human can. There's one thing that humans can do that face recognition algorithms don't do very well, and that is to, in some cases, a human can look at a pair of images and say, this is definitely a different person. And the face recognition algorithms haven't been built to do that. They've been built to say that this is, I'm pretty sure that this is the same person, but not this is definitely a different person. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's a sort of a complicated domain, but yeah. Thank you. We've got, uh, let's take one from our remote audience and we'll come back to our on-site audience here shortly because I know that there's a number of you who that are uh, on the Zoom side who'd like to have some of your questions addressed as well. So talking a little bit about algorithms specifically here, one of our questions was given that biometric algorithms becoming more ubiquitous, they're appearing in traffic lights, ubiquitous to cameras, um, what's the role of consent for some of these facial recognition systems given their ubiquity? <sighs> Tough question. <laughs> My only comment on consent is is that con convenience, you know, end users are often attracted by convenience. So I use my fingerprint sensor on my phone. I know people who don't, who refuse to do that, um, even though there's, you know, evidently some protection of the, the biometric on the phone. Uh, consent is... Uh, it's, it's difficult to, to ensure uh, that people are aware of what's going on in certain applications. And even if you provide an opt-out, it's not clear that people would ever see that opt-out. Yeah, consent is a, is a complicated concept on its own or, or any more a very controversial concept as to whether that is the appropriate or sufficient um, mechanism to engage people on any data collection. Um, as I talked about when I talked about facial recognition being a, a passive collection, it becomes even more of an issue in that context. Um, and it, it is always going to be very context and use specific. So ubiquitous is true. We're seeing it in more and more aspects, but each one of those might have different risks or might have different levels of um, engagement to achieve consent. So something that the government does with license plate readers or toll roads or things where now there might include or incorporate facial recognition is a very different you know sort of consent dynamic than the one-to-one -one matching on your phone or even a, a you know some sort of more limited tangible environment where you're going in and out using facial recognition in some way great let's take another one from our audience in the room um, and then we'll come back to some of the questions that we have Thank you. So Brenda, at the end of your remarks, you referred to legislation. I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit in terms of what might be an appropriate role for government um, when it comes to facial recognition. And, and you referred to how the technology changes so quickly, you have to be careful about how you would do that, um, not being too specific. So, so if you could answer those two things about what might be an appropriate role and if, if the policymakers try to do something, how might they go about it? doing that? How, what, what should? Million dollar question. Um, I'm probably going to disappoint you a little because um, our focus today is really more about making sure that we, we lay out the actual technology, how it works, what its capabilities are, what some of the risks and implications might be if it's used, um, and sort of leave that open as I gave that sort of list of questions that might guide that conversation in terms of a framework and some of the lists of risk evaluations as part of any sort of evaluative system. Um, FPF, of course, is always happy to, to talk later about um, uh, sort of policy positions or things like that. Um, but I think our focus for today is just trying to talk on 
the limits of the technology and what can be solved with technology versus what could be solved with either a policy decision or a legislative action. Um, I, you know, as I referenced a couple times, uh, in general, legislation, I think, should focus on the, the underlying concepts as opposed to the technology, but, you know, it, it's complicated in, in, each in each case. Did you like to add anything to that, Patrick? No. Okay. okay. So let's take a one uh, that's US sort of government employee answer. <laughs> okay. So let's take one that's sort of specific to the technology that we have. So this one came um, as you were uh, discussing your your slides there, Patrick, and that is how can 3D images maybe help to improve some of our lack of resolution, bad images um, in the 2D in order to help to improve facial recognition algorithms? Yeah, there was a lot of effort put into 3D capture. Uh, devices that can do 3D capture back in about 15 years ago. And there are standards for the interchange of 3D data. Uh, fast forward to 2017, Apple produced a, a sensor on a phone that could sense 3D information. Uh, it, 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 it's certainly uh, some slightly different information than what you get from a face. Uh, it can improve accuracy. Uh, my construction of what Apple did was to give themselves headroom for, uh, for preventing spoof attacks. That they can deploy, they can roll out new technology using that sensor suite that's built into a phone, uh, using, say, 3D information, using some other information uh, uh, in a way that they couldn't achieve with a fingerprint sensor. So face recognition, particularly 3D face recognition, would give you some resistance to spoof attacks. Uh, going forward, and that's you know valuable in high value authorization, like using an iPhone, for example. Um, 3D hasn't really taken off in U.S. government applications. Legacy photographs uh, are not 3D; they sit in databases. Driving licenses are not uh, equipped with 3D, um, you know, information chips. Uh, uh, those standards exist, but it's not being used. Thank you very much. Let's ask another question about some of the issues related to um, algorithms themselves. And this one, I think, comes to both of you. And that is, what should we do about algorithms not, that not only um, use the images and score those images um, at the same time in which they're also using those same images, images to train the algorithm? So what do you do about the use of sort of one image and simultaneous, um, and simultaneous application with an algorithm? particularly when we're talking about the use of them to retrain that algorithm to learn better prediction in the future. So if, if you talk to a face recognition developer and you say you want to uh, go and uh, use face recognition for some new application, you want to recognize people across McPherson Square here, or you want to go and recognize people outdoors, the developers will say, do you have any training data? This is manna from heaven for machine learning developers. <laughs> Uh, typically, that data is not provided, and it's not available. Uh, it's certainly not available in large quantity. Um, there is an attraction for developers to be able to use customer data, but it's typically not done. The, the, the uh, training of a face recognition algorithm requires a PhD to sit down with the data for an extended period of time. It's not, as far as I know, a, a turnkey operation mm -hmm. Uh, there are various refinements that you can do to face recognition algorithms using such data, but I think it's atypical operationally. Uh, there may be incentives to do it, but it's not typically done. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, let's take one from our audience that's coming in right now, which is that when images are collected and retained over the years, are they updated to match the age? Um, so you mentioned that NIST will be working on some things related to aging, and you mentioned the Australian government's work on that. So is there anything to indicate that an image collected 10 years ago is the same uh, as the image of a person, say, 10 years later? And how do we use algorithms to help to update some of those images in order to ensure that there's continuity of recognition over time? So in, in some applications, classically, the passport application, uh, you apply for a passport every 10 years because the face gets older. Right? Maybe in Canada, I think the passport issuance is still for five years only. There's a cost uh, consequence to doing that. Um, some algorithms that we've tested, and we've taken this out to maybe 18 years of time elapse between two photos, some algorithms are much more capable of uh, 
of verifying your identity over an 18-year time span than others. Uh, as a differentiator between algorithms, uh, aging is, uh, is a prominent topic. Um, uh, the idea to update a database, if, if you're maintaining a database, with a newer image, uh, you could do that if you trust that the image is actually of the right person. You wouldn't want to update a database if you don't really have good trust that the image that's coming in is actually the same person. Uh, yeah, but it, it is a powerful means of keeping a, a fresh database. The, as Patrick mentioned, the State Department requires every 10 years, it actually requires five years for children. If you're under 16, I think, they have to be updated every five years recognizing and then that's been the case since long before we were even using facial recognition because humans and every any other system that's going to evaluate that has that same need to sort of see fresher images um, I do know talking to some of the biometrics or facial recognition development companies you know that they recommend updates at some you know regular intervals whatever is appropriate to the the platform or the the use case um, one thing that they don't recommend is is sort of this constant iterative update. Like you want that one high quality enrollment shot, and then you want that to be the baseline for some period of time, um, as opposed to sort of like saying every time somebody walks in or walks by or whatever, partly because of the quality issues, you don't have the opportunity to sort of focus and get that high quality enrollment each time, um, but also for some sort of baselining against people who are like false positives or false negatives or something, because the training, uh, that occurs over time for the system is benefited by, by sort of having those stable um, lines. Um, there are, I think, some experimentation even with the idea of, of averaging, like keeping two or three shots in addition to the initial enrollment um, and then having it sort of compare against the set of those um, as one of the ways to increase accuracy and decrease um, you know, false negatives and things like that. So uh, I think there's a bunch of different ways to do that technically and maybe there's not one right answer for every application. Okay. Great. Um, so I ha we have one question that also came in about what can we learn from our discussion about facial recognition and improving their scores, improving the metrics um, around them to, uh, to attach to other biometric indicators. So for example, this uh, particular person asked whether or not we can learn something from facial recognition and our missteps and guidance in that um, for hand recognition. So what have we learned, and how can we then port that to other types of biometric recognition systems? Hmm. Um, hand recognition. So yes, uh, you, when I got into biometrics 20 years ago, the Department of Defense in the United States was using a hand geometry device. You would put your hand in this device. It would take a photo this way, a photo this way. And it was, it was a, a very uh, efficient system. Uh, and it was used for access control. Uh, the, the question is, what can we learn from face recognition that's applicable to other, uh, other domains? So I think this demographic issue, that if you've got a trait that is, has genetic influence, uh, and I assume hand variation would be in that category, um, that you would be concerned with demographic factors. So I think voice recognition would be in that category, potentially. Uh, it really depends on what the feature set that's being extracted from the signal is. Uh, uh, but that would be a, a, a sort of a cautionary tale um, that, that uh, what does it do in identical twins? What does it do when you've got genetic uh, linkage? Brenda? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the other types of biometric measures have actually been around or, or been in use more broadly and with more accuracy then facial recognition up until recent years. So we've been using fingerprints longer, iris scans, retinal scans. Um, there, it, I wasn't familiar with the hand picture so much, but there is one that's like a, a scan of the uh, palm where, where it takes a picture of the veins in your hand, and that's pretty personalized and individual, and there's some schools using that as opposed to uh, fingers. Um, so I think they all have, you know, the shared things in common of the feature extraction, creating a template, storing and matching process that probably we can learn from others. Um, but as Patrick said, I think the, the thing that facial recognition is unique on in one way is, is that genetic component. And now that we're seeing voice and gait and even behavioral um, 
biometric. It's arguable whether that's biometric or some new sort of category, but um, those are all going to have some of those features and might need to reflect some of the complexities that that adds to it. Thank you. We've got a question here in the room. Yeah, thank you. Can you speak a little bit more to how we can minimize the risk of a breach or, or the sort of blast radius if biometric data is breached? Like things, I mean, I know, Patrick, you touched a little bit on the uniqueness of the algorithm. Maybe there are other things that, that we can do or that you know, we're thinking about doing to kind of limit uh, that, given that you know, face and biometrics generally is not really changeable. And so once it's out there, concern that's out there. So I think it's, it's typical in operations to, uh, to collect face images, put them in a SQL database, send them to a face recognition algorithm, the templates get produced, maybe they end up in a database as well, and the service proceeds that way. But the images are retained, and you would provide, you know, maybe you would add strong encryption to those things so that if there was a breach, it would be a bit more difficult. Um, there have been suggestions that you should delete the face images completely. Uh, so why was OPM sat on fingerprint data for government employees? Why, why did they retain this? Um, uh, the, the trouble with doing that is that uh, if you delete the images, then you, there's this vendor lock-in hazard that, uh, that that vendor has now got you because you can't go and re-enroll. Um, I'm aware of an Israeli company recently that has been uh, taking face images, uh, producing, uh, I think in a video surveillance application, and then replacing the face such that most of the operators in the system don't actually see the real face, they see a fake face. And that is, I think it's for following people around a department store or maybe following people around an airport. And only certain people need to know uh, the, the true face, and that would be locked away. But the main sort of operation is using a fake face. So you, you, you're using computer graphics, essentially, to replace the face. And that's a, a sort of a, a privacy application. Uh, but a breach is, a breach is tricky because the raw data is usually retained. Uh, you know, good security appropriate to the sensitivity of the data is important and necessary for every data collection. So, you know, um, security measures that are sufficient for the system and the data you are, are holding apply in any context. Um, in addition, as I said, there's you know some sort of recognized best practices like not either not keeping the images or not keeping the images co-located with the templates, um, or you know hashing them or or uh, doing other various proactive things. Um, I, I the only other thing is I, I think it's still important to always ask that question as compared to what. So if a breach of a biometric database that has a, a set of templates in it. What is the risk of, of what can or will be done with that? What level of sophistication does it take? How can it be scaled? Um, you know, who can use it and in what capacity as compared to, say, a breach of uh, usernames and passwords and what can be done with that at scale and what can be done and what are the vulnerabilities created there? So in some contexts, it's, um, as the gentleman in the back asked earlier, as opposed to comparing it to sort of the search for perfection, the search of what the realistic alternatives actually are. Is it better or worse? And, and I'm not saying it is or isn't. In some cases it might be, in some cases it, the risk still might be more significant. But that's an important, you know, you, you don't have a perfect choice, you only have the choices you have. Um, and so where would a biometric breach rate compared to, um, you know, we read all the time about uh, breaches of things where the username and the passwords were in clear text. You know, that's, that's clearly pretty bad. Um, so choices matter. Okay, and also trade-offs matter. So we have one um, question that's also come in. How do we help to balance between the necessity and the impact of using facial recognition? Um, obviously, with many of these things, we have to balance uh, the trade-offs, uh, uh, not only privacy, security, et cetera. But what would you say is, is it a threshold measure? Is it an application-specific threshold measure? How do we really think about this, pro this ba careful balance between necessity and impact of use of FR? 
Well, I mean, I think, you know, necessity is one of those underlying questions about every particular use case. Is it necessary in the sense that it's the best, cheapest, fastest, most effective option that doesn't have some other outweighing risk um, of whether to use it or not? So maybe there are contexts, and th this is not my personal opinion or, or recommendation, this is just a hypothetically, maybe there are contexts like the criminal justice system where we want to say we don't want to use facial recognition at all, or at least not now, because because there are still so many uncertainties or inequities or unknowns or, or you know implications about it and the risks are so high it's people's literal freedom or sentencing or um, you know other other very significant impacts on people's um, rights but maybe um, we are okay with using it in an opt-in sense in commercial settings because it offers you know opportunities and goods and services to people who want it and the risks of it false positives or, or false negatives are not huge they're inconvenience maybe even some monetary impact but but not huge um, maybe we want to use it in security systems in large-scale public venues like arenas or stadiums or things like that because the accuracy and the reliability is high enough for whatever the benefits are of a better level security system than whatever the alternatives are. But maybe we don't want to use it in schools, as was brought up, because um, whatever level of security it provides in that environment maybe doesn't outweigh the risks of the impact on students of, of living in a surveilled environment. Um, again, those are all just hypothetical questions. Different people will answer them different ways. But I think that's, that's the kind of thing where you know it's rarely all or nothing. It's more what in this particular context make it valuable. If it doesn't work, what are the bad outcomes that can happen and how bad are they? And how much do we want to ameliorate that? Plus, what are our, 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 <laughs> what are our alternatives to do it differently with less risk? Patrick? Yeah, I don't have much to add. I'll just say that ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, circa 2004 in defending what they did with the chip on the passport. They established containers for face, finger, iris, and some other modalities, but primarily only the face has been used. Some nations put fingerprints on passports, pr protect them with cryptography. Uh, the face was selected uh, as, the, as the sort of interoperable, uh, universally available biometric because it had been used historically that people were used to getting their photograph taken. Uh, that, uh, that it was available to just walk up to a camera, you didn't have to touch anything, but speed through airports. So different criteria affected who needed what kind of modality. Modality, people ask me sometimes, what's the best modality? And I say, what's your application? It, 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 these questions are not uh, separable. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Brenda. Um, so for our folks joining by Zoom, just a reminder that this whole presentation will be available um, online. For those of us here today with us also, this is available online. Um, while you can find out what's coming up next from FPF from our website, including our next Digital Data Flow Masterclass number seven, which will be on our classes page, I thought I would put Patrick on the spot one last time and ask him, because we don't have that same sort of application for NIST, what's coming from NIST next? Uh, I covered it on one of the slides. In, in this biometrics realm, um, uh, we're looking at image quality. We're looking at um, presentation attack detection. Uh, can we look at a photograph and say it's a good one? Can we look at a photograph and say, Oop, that's a spoof attempt. Uh, if you force an answer, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. So, well, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you for our folks by Zoom. Um, thank you for those of us who joined us today. And if let's give a round of uh, applause to our audience. Thank you. Thank you.